So I sort of changed the uh, thing to sort of a Hobbit theme here. So this is my only disclosure. I'm the editor-in-chief of this journal. This is the number one journal. It's a subspecialty journal in anesthesia. Um, so I read 10 papers a day, minimum, sometimes more than that. Um, a lot has been going on. I think this is a rampant area of study. I mean, your, your research section, um, I think this would be a great idea is to look at your practices and see if you make a difference over time. Who's at risk? Um, this is not VCU data, but this is from Vanderbilt, where I was before VCU. And we looked at all the patients that had double the bring back rates and double the healthcare expenditures that were in the Vanderbilt health plan. And this is it. How do I use the, the uh, right there? Yeah, thank you. So fibromyalgia, this can even include fibromyalgia-like patients. So if you're going to do surgery or any procedure on a fibro patient, if they have whole body pain coupled with anxiety and depression, they're at an incredibly high risk. If they have other chronic conditions, chronic abdominal, Crohn's, IBS, chronic migraines, these two are the biggest ones probably. If you've got any of these post-surgical syndromes, CRPS, if you're bipolar, if you've got histories of substance abuse, if you use Suboxone or buprenorphine, or if you're on high doses of opioids, all those things portend worse outcomes. So you need to know that up front before you prescribe anything, because it should inform how you manage all those patients. The thing that we preach all the time is multimodal management. And I'll get into why we do that. But the bottom line is that the opioids really aren't very good. Local anesthetics, IV lidocaine can be very effective or regional blocks that use it. Um, some of these adjuvants are very good and I use all of them. What is the effect size? I, I think probably most of you in the room have a lot of misconceptions about this. If I give somebody pregabalin or gabapentin, it really depends on the pain. If they've got neuropathic pain, it might be reasonably effective. We might get a 30% effect size. But if it's musculoskeletal pain, it might be 10%. All right, so that by itself isn't gonna do much. Duloxetine, this is an evidence-based treatment, as are some of the other SNRIs. Not all of these drugs, though, do anything. Out of 50 antidepressants, probably five help pain. The rest of them are useless. Okay. Um, muscle relaxants, maybe sometimes. Capsaicin or other topical agents. Bottom line is this is a whole cornucopia of different drugs and none of them by themselves are very effective, including opioids. A lot of complex stuff. I think about this stuff every day. We have to try to block peripheral sensitization. We have to try to block what's going on centrally, and that gets into augmenting these descending inputs. So your body, pain is a good thing. Pain alerts you that something bad is happening to you, and it, and it gives you the tools to try to stop that. It could be just pulling your arm off the, the hot plate or whatever. But something from every category is useful when you're talking about pharmacologics. Barbara mentioned this, that we want to use all these non-pharmacologic techniques. I think this stuff is underdone. If you guys are going to do surgery on somebody, I would recommend in some cases that you actually get a psychologist involved and start utilizing some coping strategies and try to figure out how they cope. Do they cope chemically or do they cope uh, with other methods, uh, which could be meditation or education even. There are tons of studies that show that an educational intervention improves outcome. PCAs, I hate PCAs. Quit using them, I'm serious. They're useless. All they do is jack up the opioid requirements and they don't portend any better outcome. So I would recommend that you start using oral analgesics to the extent possible. If you're not doing ARAS, does anybody know what that is? Okay, enhanced recovery after surgery. 
This is a bunch of intelligent people that get into a room and say, we're going to protocolize how we deal with this. And then they develop the protocol. And it can include a whole bunch of different things. But regional anesthesia can be a very important thing when it's possible. There are literally five new fascial plane blocks for cardiac pain uh, or thoracotomy pain that can be used. I'll bet nobody's doing them right now. But they actually work. Mark Huntoon, uh, three years ago, drove a commercial zero-turn mower off a cliff, and I was crushed by it. I had nine rib fractures, my sternum was caved in, I had blood in my mediastinum, I needed a chest tube because I had pneumothorax, I herniated a disc, and I uh, injured the nerves of my leg. How many opioids did I take? Five. Five tablets, period. I had a thoracic epidural, for five days, I took gabapentin around the clock, got it up to 3,600, acetaminophen around the clock, and I took tizanidine to help with the muscle spasms, and I had to sleep in a chair for two months, but I didn't have to take OxyContin or anything like it. So it can be done. But I'm not a stoic individual. I have pain just like anybody else does. All right. This is a study that a friend of mine at University of Michigan did. It's a big data dump. So we looked at 88,000 people and they had to exclude a bunch. Ended up with 36,000. Number one complication of all surgery, persistent opioid use. And that reached 6% regardless of what kind of surgery it was. So anything from varicose veins to bariatric surgery, colectomies, whatever. It was all fairly uniform. So the upshot of this is that if we do 50 million ambulatory procedures a year, about 2 million more people will become persistent opioid users just from that alone. And that's probably underestimating. All right, do they work? Barbara also alluded to that. This is a Cochrane review, um, RCTs, 23 of them, meta-analysis in older patients. Now it's not just older patients, this has been done in uh, younger patients as well. Small effect size, minus 0.27. Improved function, minus 0.27. That's it. Odds for an adverse event were threefold higher. Okay? So the upshot of that is it's less than one point on a 10 point scale or less than 10 points on a 100 point scale. Function only marginally went up. And overall, the small benefits were outweighed by the adverse risks. So not very effective agents. Why is that? I'm not going to get into this too much. I know you guys aren't neuroscientists. You probably are 12 times smarter than I am because you understand cardiac physiology, which I never understood. But, but the bottom line is we have things going on. The glia, which we have always thought were not very important, we thought there were sort of structural agents in the nervous system, they actually portend a lot of uh, upregulation of pain. And glutamate, which is an excitatory amino acid that a drug like ketamine can block, uh, these protein kinase things that are going on in the cell, um, all these inflammagens that are released that can be affected by acetaminophen and NSAIDs, all those things become very important. I'd like you to understand this. This is called the two-hit hypothesis. This is an animal study. I don't want you guys to glass over here. But I, but I think it's important that you understand it. Who knows what a double crush phenomenon is? Nobody, okay. So double crush is I have diabetes or I have multiple sclerosis and I get a nerve injury. So that leads to a worse outcome. That make sense? All right. With this two hit hypothesis, the first problem is the fact that they have an injury to the nerve and then you give them morphine. I'm not going to get into all of this. These are two animal studies. This, these are types of rats, spring dolly rats and F344. We tie off the animal's sciatic nerve, okay? They become extremely hypersensitive. We put them on a hot plate or, or poke needles up at their feet, okay? Their tolerance for that goes way down to almost nothing. They're super, super sensitized. During this gray bar, we give them morphine. The animals that didn't get morphine returned to normal within a matter of a couple of weeks. The animals that got morphine 
have prolonged effects of well to three months. Okay? So opioids are not a benign treatment. They actually can make things worse when they're applied over time. Opioid hyperalgesia. This can happen during cardiac surgery. Tolerance is it takes more drug to get the same effect. Hyperalgesia is you're below the zero line. So the more drug you give, the more painful they become. And I've seen this quite a little bit. This has been shown during um, sternotomy. This is a, a group of patients that got remifentanil. Those who received remifentanil infusions um, had more problems with persistent pain. Ketamine is something that can stop this. This is another group of RCTs, meta-analysis, 70 of them, that showed ketamine was effective. This is a group of patients who are already opioid dependent. So this would apply to your patients who have uh, problems with substance abuse. If you give them ketamine um, in a double blind placebo study, they actually do better and they have less overall pain use. IV lidocaine, this is another meta-analysis, a non-inferiority study. Um, as far as visual uh, pain score, it was non-inferior in terms of morphine equivalence. Um, actually, I got that wrong. It was actually superior for the pain score, but not inferior for the morphine use. And this is just to break up my monotonous tone. <laughs> my daughter actually has lived in England for three years. She's coming back. I'm actually excited in April, but she took me there last time. This is a website, you could write it down, how to have a difficult conversation, okay? Um, excellent website, goes through this. I'm putting out a meeting in September that will be uh, in Short Pump area of Richmond. Um, it's called uh, Back to the Future, and it's, the whole meeting is about what can we do besides opioids. Concrete ideas for dealing with these problems. All right, so now we're getting into the kind of the nuts and bolts of this. What do we do? Okay, what I do when I see any patient is I do an opioid risk screen. All right, this is a, a simple one. You can get this online, the opioid risk tool. And it goes into a whole bunch of different things. It has a scoring system, whether you're a female or a male. And there's some notable things in there. So if you're a female and you were sexually abused as a child, that's three points right there. Okay. And if you're a female who was abused as a child and you're between 16 and 45, you've now moved into the intermediate risk category between 4 and 7. So you're at higher risk than a normal patient already, just with that. I've already kind of talked about these things, ADD, bipolar, depression, etc. All these things, these things jack it up. And then if you've got substance abuse issues, it goes way up. These are the patients you probably shouldn't prescribe opioids to ever. This is another one. This is called SOAP, <coughs> Screener and Opioid Assessment for Patients with Pain. It goes into a little bit different things, mood swings, uh, do you have road rage, uh, those sorts of things, um, and how often have you been in the noodle trouble. We talked about your coping strategy. How do you cope? Um, if you're a catastrophizer, this is a CAT scale. If you're a catastrophizer, you have a significantly higher risk of being a chemical coper and using too many opioids. So don't do that. This is a study that just quickly to illustrate that. So this is the brain. This is an opioid. So the patient is introduced to a stimulus that, that hurts, OK? If you don't tell them anything, you say, OK, let's, I'm going to give you this. You don't tell them it's good or bad. It, it decreases their pain slightly from here to here. Very tiny effect size. Now you've introduced a positive thing. You say, this is a powerful drug I'm going to give you. Right? The pain drops farther. Same thing. You do the same thing. You take and you say, I, I'm going to try this, but I have to tell you, the last nine patients I've tried it on, it really doesn't do a whole lot. But we'll, we'll give it a shot. It reduces completely the positive effect of the opioid. Okay, so how you think about things is super important. So when you're starting opioids, Barbara went through all this stuff. This is just a do and don't list. Check the PMP, have a written treatment agreement. I didn't include that because it's long. Uh, the one that I helped develop at VCU is three pages. 
If you don't have one, I'm happy to send you ours so you can look at it. Use it as a model for one that you might develop for your groups. And I would strongly recommend if you've got somebody on opioids, 12% ejection fraction, you know, they can't do anything, they've got pain, there's nothing else you can do, that patient might be appropriate for opioids. But they still need to be monitored. Do screen for substance abuse every time. Full period risk tool is the easiest one to do. See them back every three months. Document your rationale for continuing the opioids. See a pain specialist if possible. All right. Here's the reality. There are not enough of me to, to help you with all your problems. That's why I'm doing this talk. Um, I, I can't tell you. In a given day, I usually see about 25 to 30 patients a day. Probably five or six are just absolute dumps. It's just like, I don't want it anymore. My doctor told me that you would take over today. And there's no communication or anything. Please don't do that to pain doctors. Uh, try to find your own ways, and, and we would be happy to help you. All right. Um, you're in drug screen. I didn't know this would change. Um, I actually think it's still a good idea, and I think some of them should be surprised. So, oh, I'm, we're going to do a drug screen today. Okay. And they, you should do pill counts too. <coughs> Bring your pills with you. Do assess for the substance abuse and the opioid disorders and taper patients. I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. Try not to do this, uh, particularly um, at VCU. We've got tons of patients who have um, stopped banging scores on their sleep apnea score. They're through the roof, and they're on both benzos and uh, opioids. That's death waiting to happen. Does anybody in the room prescribe methadone? All right. we, we, we audited the other day, we found at VCU, this is a major academic medical center, we found two people who were actually prescribing methadone for a PRN sort of usage. Totally inappropriate. Uh, 15 years ago, when I was the chief at Mayo, I wrote a policy that outlawed methadone use for non-specialists like pain doctors or psychiatrists. We shouldn't be doing it. Uh, what else? We talked about the 50 MME mark, try to get below that in no longer than seven days. All right, so this is a taper algorithm. And th this, this can be done, if you remember nothing else, if you want to taper somebody, try to taper them by 10%. The only thing that matters is the duration, okay? So if they're at risk for immediate harm, let's say, You've got somebody who had surgery, they're on opioids, and they tell you, yeah, I'm using heroin regularly or I'm using cocaine regularly. I think that's pretty important to get that patient off that. So try to taper them as rapidly as you can, days to weeks. If they're not at risk for possible harm now, but you think they're at risk for future harm or they're a therapy failure, it depends on the duration of therapy. If they haven't been on the drug law, you can probably go back to the rapid taper. If they've been on an intermediate period, a variable taper, if they've been on it for a long time, you might need to do a slow taper. The other thing that's important is morphine equivalent doses. So when I was at Mayo Clinic, we had a program called pain rehabilitation. We, we showed that patients up to 300 milligram morphine equivalents, we could taper off over a three week period. So it can be done. And those patients did just as well as the patients that arrived on no opioids in terms of their own. In terms of this taper, again, a rapid one, you might do as fast as 10% daily, or you might do it by the week, 25 to 50%. I actually do a little bit slower than that. I think the 10% daily is a better way to do it. I don't like to make big jumps like this in, you know, every week or so. But once you get to one-third of the original dose, then you reduce the rate of the taper a little bit. And you use the agents what I'm, I'm going to show you next for any acute withdrawal things. For a variable taper, again, it might be a little bit slower. And for a slow taper, you might only do 10% per week or even every couple weeks for the thing. Drugs that can be helpful. Clonidine. This is the first line agent. Uh, you can give that um, TID 0.1 to 0.2. It should help you with all these palpitations, sweating, and myoclonus symptoms. You can use things like diphenhydramine for anxiety or dysphoria. For myalgias, typical analgesics tend to work pretty well. If they've got a sleep disorder, trazodone is a pretty benign drug. Uh, nausea, um, either 
Compazine or, or Ondansetron in diarrhea, loperamide, or bismuth, some sounds. Pepto bismol. <laughs> and that's it. Questions? Preoperative genetic testing. We uh, have had access to to this, and uh, I, some of it may be realistic, some may not. But with the anecdotes of I was resistant to all narcotics, and this showed that I would be prescribed differentially. And then, so my second question is on the chronic pain patients. Um, you know, in two slides, it, it sounds pretty straightforward, but when the patients don't want to be tapered, you know, how does, there's a whole other dynamic at work here in addiction medicine. And so this would imply with the taper that this is a partnership and they want to get off this. But how do we lead our patients, uh, particularly in the post-operative pain world, that have been chronically uh, taking uh, whatever, yeah, I mean, that we're going to modify this? The horses are out of the barn, right? I mean. Um, Opioid management has become just stupid everywhere, and um, it is harder. But that's why I put the, the slide up there about how to have difficult conversations. Send them to me or somebody like me that can help with that process if you don't know how to do it. But I think that's what we're going to recommend. And sometimes, you know, we don't want you to say, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore. But I, but I think by the same token, say, I'm not comfortable anymore with the amount of drug you're on. I think that we need to have a conversation with a specialist to see if there's a better way to do this because we, we're not sure we're doing the right thing for your pain. And then we can together work on that. Okay, and I might send the patient back to you on uh, four Percocet a day or something, let's say, for example, I don't know. Uh, but at least I've got it down to what I think is a safe and manageable dose that we can move forward on. Uh, that's not going to be a danger to the patient or a danger to you, frankly, for you know, over-prescribing for somebody that doesn't need that much. So it is hard, uh, but um, at Vanderbilt, when I got there, we had eight pain faculty under me, and we had three of the worst scorers in the entire medical center on the, um, the Prescani stuff um, in terms of patient satisfaction. By the time I left, in spite of doing this on a regular basis, we had three of the top scores, and we actually got a commendation thing because we, we got our scores above 85% for the entire division. It can be done, but it's, it's a slow road. You just got to be persistent. Compassionate, yet firm. I think that those are the key words that I try to use all the time. And, and go to that website for how to have those difficult conversations. I think I forgot your first question. The genetics, okay. This is probably bad, um, but I don't care. Uh, and, and the reason I don't care is what I find, the people that want me to modify my behavior because of their genetics, um, they want me to do so, I think, to get more drug nine times out of 10. And there may be a genetic reason for it, but the bottom line is I don't want to prescribe opioids because I don't think they work. So, so every, if I'm doing everything that doesn't make sense to me, I think that's where we have to get control of it again. I hope that's clear, but I, I don't know how to say it any other way. If, if somebody comes in and says, oh, I've got a genetic problem and I can't metabolize this drug, so I have to have that one, I say, okay, well, I don't know what we can do then. Uh, we're in trouble. We'll have to use other drugs or other techniques. Because remember, there's five ways to treat pain that don't involve drugs. All right? Alternative things, um, procedures that you and I all do, um, cognitive behavioral therapies, physical modalities, you know, all those things are just as important or more important than using drugs. Everybody's very drug-centric nowadays. I think we need to get away from that. Just one more question. I, yep. I, in, in this room, with this body, we share a lot of the good things, but there's also a lot of things we don't do well that we also share. And you brought up the pre whole press gainy here, and I think that, um, you know, there's some actually perverse incentives, at least in our institution, where the physician's uh, bonuses are based upon patient satisfaction. And 
it's not at a high level, but there's some level of that little voice in there saying, what the hell, just we can treat pain, and they had the good hospitalization, and we'll worry about it later. And you know, we're, do and, and we're doing it all backwards, and that's one of the, at least for me, why I wanted to hear what you all had to say, because we, we probably could use a lot of things differentially, but yet, that's one of the things we consider, and that we worry about, and that's what's published. Yeah. So it's a, I don't know, any thoughts? I'm well aware of it. I mean, at, at Vanderbilt, again, as, as an example, um, we didn't achieve what I was telling you until the final year when I was leaving the institution. So it was contractually, it was in my contract and all my division that if we met those Prescani marks, we had to be above 85% satisfaction, good or, good or excellent. Uh, we got $15,000 bonus, boom. I didn't get it because I was leaving. <laughs> so I know all about bonuses and all that stuff. But you have, to, you have to be compassionate yet firm. I think if you continue to revert back, we don't think these drugs are helping you. We think they may be harming you long term. We think we have better ideas for you. And, and we're going to do it together. I'm going to be there with you every step of the way. Get a pain psychologist to assist with that to help them learn how to do uh, better coping without drugs, et cetera. Uh, get them moving again. Um, all those things are, are playing together uh, for better outcomes. The other thing is, is that it takes time. And, yeah. and we don't have a lot of time in an appointment. I know that. You know, we just don't have it. And, you know, 10% of my salary was held back unless I reached the 85th percentile. So, I mean, I get it. And, yeah. um, and it's, it's, it's not fair right now. And, and we got here, we got here because drug companies touted in the 90s that the long-acting opioids were not as addictive as other things. And we got here because the federal government bought into whether they used the words pain is the fifth vital sign or not, that's what we all heard. Whether, whether they said it, they deny they said it now. Yeah, Jaco says they didn't say that. Jaco says they didn't say it, but everybody in this room who is of a certain age or older heard that. So, I, I mean, I'm going to go with security and numbers. Um, and, you know, that's what, that's what we were taught, that, that pain, is, pain is the fifth vital sign, and that we had to ask it, and we had to have these little smiley faces. And, and it got, you know, we were lulled into a false sense of security, and our, our, our finances depended on making them happy. And, and that's changing, but it's not going to change overnight. I mean, I, I do think that with the, with the statement both Virginia was ahead of the federal government in declaring this an, uh, an emergency, Virginia was a year ahead of the federal government, but once that came out, um, I think that's changing, and I think hospital corporations are starting to say we can't, we can't use this, but it's still, it's very painful for us. I mean, you didn't get your 15000 I, I mean, I, I didn't get mine, I, you know, and I, and I ran out of time to do the work, even though I knew what I wanted to do. It's, it's just hard. And I think it'd be great just to uh, take a whole contingent of your folks and, and go to the, the board of the hospital or whatever and say, we don't think this is fair. We're trying to comply with these uh, regulations that the state has put out. We feel handicapped by that and see if you can get some modifications to that. I don't know. I mean, we shouldn't be penalized for trying to do the right thing, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, please. I'm just curious, to, uh, do you know what the uh, effect of uh, legalizing marijuana has been in <laughs> certain states on the opioid epidemic? Yeah. Um, that's sort of like genetics to me. You know, <laughs> okay. The simple fact is that because marijuana has been treated like heroin, you know, as far as scheduling goes by the DEA, it hasn't been well studied. And uh, the, the studies that I have seen, I think, I think cannabinoids are going to be future therapeutics, but it might be for topical things, or it might be for things that we don't think in terms of like pain. Uh, but I think we're talking about a, a 10 milligram equivalent uh, effect. We already talked about the effect sizes of all these other drugs, which are small. I think marijuana is in the same area. Okay? And it's illegal in most states. Um, so the way I treat it, if I'm, if I'm prescribing for somebody, then I, then I want to know they're on it. And I tell them, 
you know, you're going to have to come off of this. If you want me to prescribe for you, you're going to have to get that out of there, and I don't want to see it in any drug sprays from now on, or I'm not going to prescribe it. So I, I kind of force their behavior like that. But, but don't delude yourself into thinking it's having some huge effect on, all, on people's pain. It is not. And then, and then just a comment. You mentioned, I think, using opioids in patients with EFs of 12%. Yeah. Uh, some some of them prolong QT interval and okay. you may not be dangerous in that scenario. Yeah. I'm just saying I understand what, you know whether it's chronic cardiac disease or chronic kidney disease or whatever. There are certain subgroups of patients. You know, what else are we going to do? Right? I mean, there's only so many treatments that are currently available. So that's why we need more research. Uh, but certainly, you know, if if I have uh, a 70 year old lady who's who's got cardiac failure, or she's got kidney failure or something, and I can give this drug and she takes two or three a day, God bless her. You know, I, that's just how I feel about it. I don't care about that. We're trying to get these big fish. Okay, so what we're looking at at our institution now is methadone and long acting. I think we should just pretty much get rid of that. There's no good reason for it most of the time. And, and actually, I'm, I'm going to speak to this because I... Yeah, I'm not sure. All right. I'm, I'm also board certified in palliative care, and I'm going to say something that's almost uh, heretical, but we overdose cancer patients, and that's why I don't necessarily agree with your sickle cell change, because I think there's a lot of sickle cell patients and a lot of cancer patients that are getting too much drug, and there are better ways to manage them sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Okay. Anything else? is facing this, but like there's no point. So you get your immediate post-op patient, they've had their sternotomy, everybody's a little bit different in how they experience their pain. What would be your top three non-opioid recommendations for pain medication? Because like, the, like we're not going to have fentanyl. Like we have one week supply worth of fentanyl. We don't have much dilated left. <coughs> we're kind of forced from an IV perspective. The PO stuff is there. But you know, you're not going to give that to somebody intubated. Like, but, and we want to get away from that in general. But what would be your top three recommendations to do? Um, no, I, I can't think of an analogy, but it depends on the pain. It depends on the patient, uh, because all pain is not the same. I have Tylenol. Anybody anybody we do have Tylenol, but they only give us one dose. But they excavated six hours, so they'll get their next dose. We're doing around the clock Tylenol. The lidocaine patches are kind of iffy. You know, they either work or they don't work, and they probably don't work, and they're expensive. Um, Lidocaine probably works not so great topically like that, but, if, but a systemic infusion works pretty well. But then we do, <coughs> then we do Expirel for some of the, like the mini mitrals get Expirel, so you're excluded from all the other canes for 96 hours. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. But we don't do anything. Again, this is why I think you need to put together teams to talk about those sorts of things and develop these enhanced uh, recovery protocols. That's the way to do it. You take all the things into account in how are we going to approach that. I mean, like, for me, for thoracotomy, I think what I had myself, I mean, I was the, the chief of the division. I said, do this for me, please. You know, and, and uh, whenever you can do those kind of things, I think that makes sense. So, as much of the multimodal as you can do. And if there's a, a, you know, a risk or something, then take that into account and balance the risks and benefits of it. But again, you're not going to find anything that's really... You know, that, this is my slam bang partner that I can bring in every time. It, just, it doesn't exist right now. You have to use tons of different things. And it could even include healing touch or, you know, other uh, biobehavioral techniques. <coughs>